Hello and welcome to The Good Council, the podcast of the World Future Council. In each episode, we'll highlight current challenges and policy solutions. And we'll also take you on a journey of inspiring stories. Listen in to another of our intergenerational dialogues from around the globe. Good morning, my name is Annika, I'm 25 years old and I'm a consultant at the World Future Council. In this episode, I have the pleasure of speaking with Jakob von Uxko, who is the founder of the World Future Council. Born in Sweden in 1944, he grew up in Hamburg and went on to study philosophy, politics and economics at the University of Oxford. As a member of the European Parliament, he served on the Political Affairs Committee uh, from 1987 to 1989 and later on the UNESCO Commission on Human Duties and Responsibilities. He also served on the board of Greenpeace uh, Germany as well as on the Council of Governance of Transparency International. He's a patron of the Friends of the Earth International and lectures widely on environmental justice and peace issues. As Jakob was becoming increasingly desperate at the development of the health of the planet and the finite resources that are continuously being exploited, he set out to cause change. First, by creating and establishing the Right Livelihood Award, which is also known as the Alternative Nobel Prize, and later the World Future Council. And today, we'll listen to him tell the story in his own words. Hello, Thank Jacob. You. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for being here today. Thank you. It's a pleasure. So it's a real pleasure actually for me to have this conversation with you um, and I think uh, there's a lot to learn uh, for me from you and I'm looking forward to learning from you about yourself and also about the World Future Council. So to start with, what's your life's mission in one word? One word, well the future is the future. Uh, the future. And that's also, I suppose, the World Future Council, that's, that's the name um, and I'm curious also why did you why did you call it the World Future Council? Because I saw that uh, we were we are living in a very um, short, uh, sort of short-tempered way where we are not really uh, we're looking at, we're looking at a future which is um, really very threatening, and uh, we could change it in time, but it's, it demands a lot of very deep and profound change. And there wasn't really an organization which was focused on that. And so I thought we need such an organization. Right, OK. So I'll come back to that in a moment. But you say, you know, your life's mission is the future. And obviously, the World Future Council is about the concern about future generations. So where does your concern um, about future generations come from? Uh, growing up, um, in a very sort of remote part of uh, of Sweden, uh, my first uh, eleven years, you know, and uh, being and, and, and loving nature, and then so the more the more I started reading and realizing what threats there are to nature, it seemed to me that there was uh, a need for such an organization. So I just, uh, but of course, you know, this came after the Right Livelihood Award. First of all, I I believe that uh, Right Livelihood was the way to live our lives and so I, I had this idea for this organization but it was very much a challenge to the Nobel Prizes you know so I, I called it from the beginning the alternative Nobel Prize and to my surprise instead of being uh, sort of uh, rejected or ignored um, a, um, a member of the Swedish Parliament arranged for us to present these awards in the Swedish Parliament you know from the beginning uh, well, we had we had sort of one or two years when we presented them privately, but then she brought us into the Swedish Parliament. So I realized then that there was really uh, an interest in solutions. There was a deep uh, discomfort with um, the way things are at the moment, because if you look at the the world today, the Nobel Prizes are really the most prestigious awards in in, in the on the planet. Yeah. And so to say that they need an alternative. And to say that in Sweden, the country of the Nobel Prizes, was really quite a challenge. And to my, uh, you know, pleasant surprise, it was uh, th there was a response. And so, um, doing this for quite a few years, uh, I always felt, you know, and then going into going into politics because I, I realized if you want to change things, you have to change the law. You know, laws don't move the heart, but they restrain the heartless, as Martin Luther King said. 
So that was the, uh, the reason why I had the idea for, of the World Future Council. I wrote a book about that. And um, uh, again, pleasantly surprised, there was a response, including from the, the city of Hamburg, where I had uh, grown up as a teenager. Yes. So the Right Livelihood Award awards um, the award <laughs> to individuals who cause great positive change in terms of livelihood, justice, human rights issues, social issues that are not covered by the by the Nobel Prize, right? And why did you think we need a prize for that? So why specifically the Right Livelihood Award? Again, because uh, of the ex of the existence of uh, prizes and, and, and honors, mm -hmm. which are very much focused on the, on the, the, the present. And so I, I realized that um, we needed an award which was focused on, on solutions which didn't, didn't fit in. You know, the, the, as, as I said, the Nobel Prizes are the most prestigious prizes within the current world order. And the uh, right livelihood is a prize going beyond the current world order because the current world order, which is very much the, 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 the modern, uh, you know, modernity, uh, is is really in a very short time. It, it's it's life which is not. It's it's a modernity which is not possible for the whole world population. And at the same time, there's no reason why some people should have it and some people shouldn't have the advantages. So you basically have to uh, have to find solutions which are more um, uh, all uh, which 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 cover a larger range. Some of the, these uh, the right livelihood awards. Some of these prizes are. Um, just take things further, but others come from a com completely different world uh, worldview, where we look at what the world needs and not what what we need. Mm. So then um, you you founded the World Future Council. What a story! So what's the vision for the World Future Council? What was it in the beginning, and is that still the same? I think very much so. Again, to what, what kind of uh, future can we have which the whole population of the world can, can benefit from? And uh, at, at currently we have a, a modernity which is uh, not transferable to the whole world. At the same time, there's no reason why some people should benefit from it and others shouldn't. Mm. So how can we spread these benefits but at the same time making sure that they are benefits which also benefit, benefit the planet and benefit nature? So maybe um, just as a sort of basic, um, as a foundation for our conversation, maybe you can just give a, um, an overview of what the World Future Council is and what it does. Well, the World Future Council was very much set up to ensure that the, the future is sustainable and, 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 and global, because at the moment, as I said, you know, we have a future which is very focused on a small minority and uh, pretends to care about the rest of the world, but basically it's a, it's, it's a lifestyle which is not globally replicable. And so the, um, the World Future Council uh, looks at that challenge and picked it up and uh, you know, wondered what kind of solutions do we need to, um, to, to change that. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was very much uh, uh, filling, filling a gap in current institutions because there are so many who basically are are built on the current present, but um, don't look at it from the future, from the perspective of the future. And this is what the World Future Council does. And in its day-to-day -day, um, activities and, and actual work, what's, what's the core work of the World Future Council? It's very difficult to sort of say that it's just one um, core activity because, of course, um, the future the, the, is as diverse as the planet is diverse. The Future Council World Future Council membership is very diverse, and so they have different um, different priorities, all within creating a sustainable future. But still, we focused on areas where there was uh, the the support, the, also the financial support to do the work, but also very much uh, the the interest of um, the most active uh, councillors took took priority. And that's all through policy work, right? That, that all through policy work. Yes, exactly. So it's about the finding the right policies and seeing what works, right? It's along your maxim yeah. of why live with problems that we can solve. Exactly. It's your 
um, your life motto, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, exactly. Okay, so when when you founded the council, that was in two thousand seven. Well, That's the work before was a bit. Before that was we had a had a, had a sort of tried to have a debate which was as glo as global as possible. Yeah. We looked at um, the uh, the membership of you know how that could be as as diverse. Uh, as as, uh, as as was possible. At the same time, we needed people who were already ex in, in, in actively involved in trying to create a better future. Yeah. And uh, so, when we had a, a about, about 500, 600 sort of candidates, we then started a, a, a dialogue with people and organisations who are working in the similar areas, finding out who they recommended should be actually a, a member because we couldn't have more than about 50 members. Yeah. And as a result of that, we got the council and we got its priorities. And its priorities, of course, also responded on, on the needs, the current needs of the planet. You know, why do you, the future policy award which we set up was very much, um, uh, you know, an annual prize for the area of which was regarded by, including international organizations, but which regarded, was regarded by our supporters as the most urgent area to work on at that time. Were there any sort of particular challenges that, or maybe uh, that you, well, still remember from the very beginning of founding the council? One, of course, there's so many interested people that would like to be part of it, so you have to narrow it down to about 50, but anything else maybe? I mean, it's, you're setting up a network across the globe of people who are working in their own field, but they also have a common interest, which is preserving our planet for future generations. Were there any challenges? Well, making sure that this common interest, which you mentioned, actually uh, was, was prioritized, because clearly everybody uh, works in a certain, in a different area, or many people work in different areas and see these areas as the most important one. So we had a lot of uh, Diplomatic diplomacy was needed to make sure that we s we chose uh, priorities, okay. and also um, the membership of the council, of course, had to reflect those priorities. Who was responsible for that diplomacy? Well, uh, the uh, the founding members, uh, you know, I I had sort of to do a lot about it, and it was uh, I had uh, f found that there were cases, there were some people who left, you know, who couldn't. Yeah. Didn't didn't fit into this um, for this um, uh, very challenging uh, agenda. Mm. And conversely, what are some of the successes from the very beginning? Because it was something that hasn't been done before, mm. and obviously there's you know there's always the infancy of a project, and yeah. then suddenly you can see it pays off. So what's the me like a memorable success that you have? Well, I think the idea to have a um, parliamentary uh, representation of future generations, how could that be? That has been, a, 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 that was a dialogue which didn't really exist before and which we brought, uh, brought um, in, into reality. And uh, I think in uh, some areas which have been very much, have been in other areas which have been very challenging, uh, included those for which we, we awarded the um, the, the, the Future Policy Award and where we uh, joined in with existing campaigns but helped to uh, make them more future focused. It's really, it's really fascinating and um, you mentioned uh, just a while ago that there was a, a good public response. Um, has that always been the case or was that straight from the get-go that people recognize this as a as a good project uh, that that merits support or was there a little bit of a tough work that you had to do <laughs> before you got there um, well uh, no it's more or less it uh, it's more that it ran in, in, in parallel uh, parallel of course there were uh, journalists who thought that this was a very arrogant name uh, but it was interesting that uh, this very um, visionary Hamburg entrepreneur, Dr. Michael Otto, he uh, liked the idea. He came to me when the book was published and had, and had you know, a couple of questions about it, and then he supported it. And his support, of course, was instrumental in bringing the Hamburg um, 
mayor and, and the Hamburg parliament on board. So without that um, beginning, that financial support, we wouldn't have been able to launch it. Yeah, and that's super important. If you want to set up something like that right now, what is it that you need to get together? Basically, I think you need uh, sort of charismatic leadership. It's very good sort of uh, to say that uh, it has to be very you know, democratic and everybody has to be involved, but somebody has to take the initiative. So that's you. Uh, <laughs> well, I, I took the initiative, but yeah. very, very quickly I yeah. brought together yeah. you know, a core membership and I had co-founders. You know, Dr. Otto was, was one of them, obviously, who um, brought the whole thing uh, in, into reality because it's very, uh, it, it's, it's very easy to talk about what needs to be done. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I've, I've seen so many initiatives which haven't, haven't succeeded because, uh, you know, there has, there has been too many, there have to been too many inter internal disputes, unfortunately. While we had some disputes, we were able to get off the ground before they before before they hit, and so we have been able to to survive some conflicts. And some people, as I said, either left and others others joined. But uh, it's very much uh, also f trying to be, be hit the the in the in interest of the day. What is actually most uh, inspiring? And the fact that we had such a good, and have had, uh, still have such a good media pr media presence, I think has been because even, um, especially also media representatives have realized that this is really an, a, an idea whose, whose time has come. And it probably also helped um, the, the charismatic leadership to get people together in the first place um, and keep them engaged. Well, yes. I mean, I've never regarded myself as very, uh, you know, inspiring, charismatic. I just tried to sort of do my job. But I realized uh, from the response I've had in the media that, uh, you know, people have um, really liked, realized that this was an idea whose time had come. Moving on uh, to younger generations, I'd like uh, to pick your brain on what do you think about the current youth and young people nowadays and about their activities and political participation? What do you think about that? Well, in, in, in general, it's, it's very, it is very difficult to sort of generalize because, of course, uh, you know, growing up in, in, um, in, in the world uh, of today must be extremely challenging and very hard because yeah. until <laughs> until recently, you know, we had this idea that uh, we we're going to get this global global future, which meant everybody was going to live and have a good, comfortable life. And and now we are seeing threats. The climate threat, of course, is the most uh, overreaching threat possible to imagine. I mean, it is it's within a comparatively short uh, time period. We are we are fa we are facing a threat to our very survival, and uh, so of course it's easy to flee from that. It's easy just to sort of live in the present, mm -hmm. but uh, fortunately there is an increasing number. I notice that uh, you know uh, no, no, more and more, an increasing number, especially of, of of young people who are prepared to take, you know, take the necessary changes to, to be prepared to work for for solutions, even if that's not uh, something which one would like to. Uh, you know, which one is sort of comfortable with, which which one would like to sort of see, uh, uh, you know, as 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 one's life. It's very it's very challenging. Thank you for recognizing that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's it's a bit of an obvious question, but why are young people so important for our future? Well, it's it's their future more than anybody else's future, and of course, you know, if we did, if the young people didn't weren't part of the struggle, then it, it would be a very short-term struggle and it wouldn't really lead anywhere. Yeah, and if that's not an argument enough, then what would you advise uh, young people today uh, to do? What should they do? Why should they become active? Well, again, you know, what, what is the alternative? There is no alternative anymore to really be part, become part of the solution, because if we're not part of the solution, we're part of the problem. There's no neutrality possible mm -hmm. in, in such a challenging environment. Yeah. Do you have any other p 
piece of advice, irrespective of maybe what they're choosing to do with their life, that you can pass on to young people today, based on what you've learned in your life and looking back, etc.? Well, not to take anything for, anything for granted and to take any information you're giving, any, any, uh, the, the current uh, leadership don't believe that you know, they have the solutions because unfortunately they don't. And so you have to be prepared to challenge almost, well, challenge everything in order to, but at the same time, not just challenge it as a, like, like a cynic, but actually do something. Even, uh, even small solutions you know, can, can grow and if you multiply small solutions and they become big solutions. So be, be constructive. Mm, very much. Be critical and yeah. Okay. But at the same time, you know, be be, be practical. Realize that even one step ahead is a step ahead. You know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll I'll try and remember that. <laughs> Sometimes it's easy to think I need to make big change to be effective and well. Yeah. But lots of small changes also become big changes. So you know, it's it's very important not to be. Otherwise, it's very easy to become totally uh, disillusioned because you know nobody can save the world on their own. Yeah. As a as a role model, very much for future generations, um, you have done a lot to try and pass on a healthy planet to current and future generations. What's your hope? For future generations. Well, my hope is very, is, is very much that uh, I have inspired more, you know, uh, people, and especially, you know, of course, the young people. But it's inspired, uh, uh, been a, been a sort of a uh, an example of what one person can do, and. Uh, there, nobody needs to replicate that, but it's, it just shows if you can uh, come in there and it, uh, where I had grown up in Sweden, but I hadn't lived there for many years and uh, uh, challenge the biggest, most sort of famous Swedish invention in a way internationally, the Nobel Prize, and get the response, a positive response, including from the Swedish parliament and from the Swedish media, that just shows you know, what, is, what is possible. So just look at, uh, you know, don't, don't be too disillusioned. Don't, don't um, doubt what's possible, you know, well, believe in what, is, what you can do. Um, and a, an anecdote comes to mind. Well, it's an anecdote of your life, really, because uh, you sold your entire stamp collection to create well, the alternative. Well, it was more than that. It was, um, it was my, my job, you know, I, I, I collected, but I also dealt, I was buying and selling stamps. So you gave up everything, basically. Well, I, I still had to make a living, so I still continue dealing in stamps. But what I had accumulated at the time, most of that I, I, I sold to, to finance the Right Lab Awards. But unfortunately, you know, after not a long time, um, other donors came in. There was a Swede who'd um, won um, a top prize in the lottery. And uh, he donated, he said, I don't, need, I don't need this money. He donated it to the Right Lab Awards. And then there is, and, but our, our biggest donations have come from Germany, especially from one, one German lady. But it's, it's interesting that uh, although it's a, very much uh, you know, a Swedish award, most of the financial support has actually come from, from Germany and from the German-speaking world, from yeah, Switzerland. Yeah. Yeah. There's a huge lesson to be learned from that as well, to be completely selfless. And I mean, completely goes against the capitalist urge and uh, kind of pressures of the market today, isn't it? To completely um, sacrifice one thing, sacrifice your assets for something that you really believe in. I think maybe is that also something that is good to know for, for young people to Yeah, it's very much good, uh, good to know, I think. And uh, you know, the, the market is always such a, uh, means so many things to people, you know, and, and uh, we used to be, we were critical of uh, market of its of its focus we used to quote word laws environmental laws in communist countries in the soviet union for example and uh, saying you know they are, they, they are better and they were better on paper but if we found in practice they weren't at all better now you know the in, in fact the, the they just weren't followed they were just uh, propaganda to um, uh, in in the uh, was just propaganda in the cold war 
the, the, the so-called better environmental laws in, in, uh, in the Soviet uh, Empire. And so uh, the market isn't, uh, isn't a problem. People live in markets, but to prioritize the market is, uh, of course, very, 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 very dangerous. Uh, you always have to have a, you, if you, your, goal, your goal cannot be to maximize your own monetary wealth. Your goal needs to, uh, max needs to be to maximize yourself as a person and to maximize uh, the well-being of the planet where you, uh, where you live. Mm. Which is <laughs> very much not the focus of <laughs> what the markets are oriented towards today. <laughs> oh yes, oh yes. And, uh, but it's, it's, it's interesting now, or even people who used to believe in markets even a few years ago that the market would pri provide a solution. And now they are coming and saying we need to intervene, we need to, to change the framework. You know, within that framework, uh, markets can be effective, inventors can be effective. But uh, above all, we need the right to, to set the right framework. Approaches and and what, is that, what does that mean? It means the right laws. And that, again, why the World Future Council was uh, created, because uh, I saw solutions where were key and solutions were what the, the right ladder awards are, are promoting and solutions are still key but without uh, without legal solutions ultimately we're not going to get there because again you know as Martin Luther King said they, we, we need to it's not just in, uh, not just enough to um, inspire people you need actually to restrict the restrict those who want to don't uh, want to be inspired yeah. but I mentioned in the introduction that you were um, a member of the European Parliament, mm. but then you, you founded the, the World Future Council a couple of years later, or actually a few decades later, <laughs> according to the timeline. Why didn't you um, remain a part of political life? You say that it's actually the laws that cause change. Mm. Uh, it was a difficult, difficult choice, but I found that um, a, a career in the European Parliament would not uh, get me as uh, where I wanted to be. I wanted to be like a catalyst, and I found uh, maybe I could have continued to do that also as a parliamentarian. But you know, the the, the day has 24 hours. I just had to um, prioritize, and uh, I found uh, that I wasn't the uh, person who would. Uh, for a political career, I, I didn't. It, it didn't really sort of seem to fit my priorities, but uh, I, I kept on. Uh, I mean, I, I was the, the Green Party put me up on on their list, and I was very glad. Was very gra grateful for that. But then they became a more conventional party. And hopefully now they will, you know, have uh, go back to benefit the from that. Go back to the roots. Yes, especially when they get into power. Um, but so, um, yeah, so I, I had different uh, priorities. I couldn't see myself putting in the energy I would, I would have needed. You know, and I was, I was um, living in England, living in London, because I found it very, it's a very global city. And for the work I was doing, it, it had certain benefits. But clearly, you know, if I wanted to be a German politician and I have a German nationality and Swedish nationality, I would have had to go back to one of those two countries. And it didn't really sort of fit in with my life. Okay, that makes sense. <laughs> um, you spoke with many people in your life, politicians, entrepreneurs, advisors, business people, investors, policy makers, all of them. What would you say is the one biggest obstacle to actually implementing um, the changes that we know will work? Very much the belief in the current uh, global system. Uh, which, of course, uh, is, is a capitalist system. There is no doubt that uh, there is uh, too much trust in that and not enough trust in, the, in uh, what we can do to uh, rectify what's going on in the world. It's uh, very difficult to have a, a vision which is global because, uh, and I remember the uh, prominent German politician saying to me that, you, you know, look at the uh, Television is now everywhere. You know, look at the lives people lead in Africa. There, everybody wants a German lifestyle or an American lifestyle, and that is just uh, not physically possible. Yeah. And so, uh, I think, you know, to 
uh, make the alternative sound attractive, which obviously means sharing to a certain extent. Uh, you know, uh, everybody has to have the basics, but um, moving moving beyond that and having different priorities, you know, is going, is extremely hard because most people find themselves uh, part of the system. So is it either? those with a high standard of living going back to a simpler lifestyle or is there a possibility an opportunity for those who have not yet attained that lifestyle to sustainably and justly reach that lifestyle that everyone else seems to already be living is it one or the other or and which one is it is there a third option well i mean the you have to find uh, an in-between in, in solution because uh, the, uh, the the consumption of um, of Germany or the USA is never going to be globally possible. But at the same time, uh, making sure that people have enough, you know, for the uh, to, pro to protect themselves against uh, dire poverty straits against starvation etc there is enough so there there is enough for uh, for a simple lifestyle the world has enough for everybody's need but not for everybody's greed as, as Gandhi said you know yeah. that is the truth um, more than ever and um, <clears throat> that is now the, the the climate threat shows that and the, the politicians who are underst have understood the climate threat are still not uh, daring to sort of say what it actually what it actually means. The rich are going to have to find other ways to support themselves uh, and to build a sustainable uh, lifestyle than a, than uh, rather than um, having more more uh, accumulate more possessions, and that's a very difficult truth to say because. Um, it means it means well higher taxes and uh, environmental taxes, climate taxes, uh, in order to uh, make sure that there is enough um, for everybody's need. So how do we go? Because you say it's the belief in the capitalist system, the belief in the <clears throat> priority of the market forces that are an impediment to creating positive, sustainable, uh, future-just change. How can we uh, eradicate that obstacle? Well, uh, you know, as I said before, the, uh, the the communist societies did not really have a good environmental uh, record, so abolishing the market by itself will not will not do it. The question is what framework the market operates within. Uh, of the head of the International Energy Agency, Fatih Birol who was very much a, a believer in the market until a few years ago and, and now he, he just says uh, we have to basically prioritize, uh, prioritize the environment and uh, the market will have to fit within those priorities. So there has already been some sort of uh, change in the right direction over the last couple of years or maybe decade? In the awareness, yes. In the actual policies, not. That's, that's a big step which needs to be taken. And now we have um, the, uh, just very little time left to do this. You know that's why these climate meetings, like in the one in Glasgow in the uh, end of this year, will be extremely important. Is there anything that the listeners um, can do in their own lives, collectively, individually, that you can advise them on? It doesn't have to do with policies unless, you know, it's about elections and who they vote for, but is there anything that they can do in their own lives? I think everybody has to make uh, their own, uh, make, make decisions based on, you know, where, where the planet is at and uh, where they are at. And I think we have to meet the needs of the planet in order to uh, ensure that there is uh, that the, the freedoms we have to, to, to choose, to, uh, that we don't just have less and less freedoms because we have lived above our lived above our means. Yeah. So it's very very difficult for me to live uh, sort of lives a, a comfortable lifestyle 
uh, to tell people to, you know, you can't have that. But at the same time, I've always been aware that, um, you know, we have to have given away a lot because I've, I've always felt that they went up for sore solutions. I wanted to support them. And I think this is always, this is what we have to prioritize. Look at what's, what is globally possible, solutions which are globally possible, and then, then support them. Is our generation still up for the challenge that we're facing? That's the most, the most difficult question. I think that uh, if we're not up to the challenge, then uh, you know, we're, we're facing a sort of global disaster. You know, there's no way we can continue uh, globalizing on the, according to the present model. And I do think that there are enough inspiring solutions that one can expect people to, you know, it's not, it's, we are not saying that you have to, you're going to have to live in, 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 in misery, but we're saying, you know, you have to be prepared to live uh, less materialistic and more sharing lifestyles mm -hmm. and, you know, sharing many of the things which we have taken for, for granted to have to just to have that everybody should have. And, and of course, that means that you'd, you'd need a different economic system because at the moment the system is basically based on on eternal growth and on everybody uh, maximizing their own benefits. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've, you go to places, for example, and where people live more communal lifestyles, they share, and sometimes people do that in their, in their summer houses, you know, they share washing machines, but when they go back to their own residences, they all believe that they should have their own washing machine, you know. And it's, but this is also a way of organizing, or organizing the sharing, and I believe that, um, it, it certainly is possible in time, but whether we will do it in time is very, very difficult to say because the, the propaganda of the individualistic market is very, very powerful and has raised, as we know, see what's happened in China, how this has become now the global, uh, global goal. And we know very much that it's not a global goal. It is it's not possible for it to be a global goal to have these, um, whether German or US lifestyles. So are you hopeful looking to the future? I'm hopeful because I've seen what I've been able to do. And if, if one person can, can, can do this and, and get such a positive response, even from you know, the current uh, parliamentarians and, and uh, political powers and the media, then uh, I, I believe that uh, it's possible to be hopeful. So what is your uh, biggest accomplishment in life? These two uh, organizations I, I created, I think uh, that they have, they have been dependent on so many other people to grow from beginnings, but with, without me they wouldn't have uh, they wouldn't exist, so I think that that is, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy with that. Are there any lessons learned in your life? It's always focus on what, uh, what you can share and see how you can, uh, how you can build solutions for the most urgent problems we face and do that without, uh, uh, without saying, oh, this is unrealistic. You, know, you never know what's realistic until you try it. That's a really good one. <laughs> That's going to go in the highlight section. <laughs> what did you learn about, it's a bit more of a personal question, what did you learn about yourself, um, who you are? Is there anything that surprised you? Well, I took a step-by-step -step approach, so I don't know that it, uh, that it surprised me, but I'm always aware that uh, I haven't, you know, that um, I have not really been such a team person as I, as I feel I should. I've, I've been in, uh, as an, an individualist and I've done what I could as an, as an individual, but maybe I could have uh, you know, achieved more if I had been more, like a, more of a team worker, I don't know. Well, but it's always been a team effort, as you say, you know, it's always... Um, yes. There's been a lot of support from... Yes, there has been. And I'm very proud of the team, of the, the, 
World Future Council team. It brought together some amazing individuals and still does. So on that note, I think um, we, can, we can end on a very good note. Okay. And uh, it's been an absolute pleasure. Mm. And I'm so delighted that we got to have this conversation. Uh, thank you very, very much for your time and uh, enduring this questioning. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this week's episode. We hope you enjoyed this inspiring conversation and will tune in again for more next time. This podcast is brought to you by the World Future Council, a foundation that identifies, develops, highlights and disseminates future just solutions for the current challenges that humanity is facing. To support our work, find us at www.worldfuturecouncil.org, as well as on YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook and, of course, in our next episode. What are the solutions for our common future? The World Future Council works toward a healthy and sustainable planet with just and peaceful societies. Now and in the future. To achieve this, we identify and spread effective policy solutions for current challenges humanity is facing and honor them with our Future Policy Award. Our council consists of 50 eminent global change makers. Current and future generations have the right to live on a peaceful and healthy planet. Are you in?